Hello. I'm Jenna. If you don't know me, I'm Jenna's Plants on Instagram. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who watched um, the houseplant tour that I put out. I was a little nervous, kind of my first video that I put publicly on YouTube and just everyone who liked or left a nice comment like that was just so encouraging and it makes me want to do some more videos so today I want to talk about thrips I know it's a problem that a lot of houseplant parents have encountered myself included and I felt like recently I've had a few um, friends that have been dealing with the issue as well. First of all, like why are thrips such a problem? Why do they have like such a bad rep in the plant community? One thing is they're just super hard to get rid of once you have them. Uh, so the thrips life cycle is that the adult thrips lay their eggs in the leaves, so in the plant tissue. They also feed on the plant tissue. This does a lot of damage. The eggs hatch into larvae. The larvae also eat the plant tissue. So they end up being very damaging, very destructive, and they're extremely small, so they can get in the like newly developing leaves. You can't even see or spray or get in there, but you have this little bug chewing on all this soft plant tissue with this like sucking um, needle-like mouth parts, and they can do a ton of damage very quickly. They also spread very easily and reproduce very quickly. I believe that a uh, a female thrip doesn't, or thrips, I'm gonna probably do that wrong throughout the video, but um, I believe the singular is thrips, and the plural is also thrips, so just FYI, don't hold it against me if I mess that up. Yeah, so I believe a female thrips can lay eggs without even needing a male. So essentially, you only need one thrips to have hundreds within a very short span of time. So that's one reason they can be a huge problem and they can be very damaging on not just one plant, but on an entire collection if they're left unchecked. So how do you know if you have thrips? Usually with thrips, you'll see the damage before you actually see any adults. Um, this is very common and I'm going to kind of be categorizing them into two uh, different types. The one I've most frequently encountered are these larger black thrips. Now these larger black thrips um, leave very distinct uh, kind of jagged chew marks usually on the backs of the leaves and they leave these little black poots within those chew marks. That's the kind of hallmark defining thing that I usually look for to be sure that it's thrips and not something else. That's the best way to identify those I'm just calling them black thrips. I think there's a few different names, whether they're greenhouse thrips or there's tons of different thrips varieties and you may even have something different depending on um, where you are in the world. To identify the adults, they're very slender, dark in color. They're almost diamond shaped where the middle part of them is like the thickest part and then they kind of like taper off for their head. Hello, Dicker. The larvae are small, white, they look like little wormy things, kind of. Um, they can also be clear, so they're very difficult to see and they're a bit smaller than the adults, so you might miss the larvae entirely if you're checking your plants. Now these other category of thrips that I'm referring to, I'm just calling like small brown thrips. Uh, it seems like these are probably western flower thrips, but there are again a few different types of thrips that are like small, brown, and the thing that makes them different from these like large black thrips, one they're smaller so they're harder to see, and second, I haven't seen them really leave those big black poops. They might leave ones that are very small and maybe lighter in color, so I personally in checking over some plants that I know were damaged by these bugs, I couldn't find any sign of these um, telltale poops that I usually see with the black thrips. One reason it's very difficult to identify them is because the damage can look very similar to spider mite damage. So uh, spider mite damage will often look like little pinpricks. The damage from these thrips maybe isn't exactly the same damage pattern 
I've seen it present kind of differently in different plants. For some like thicker leaved philodendrons, it almost looks like little um, divots or punctures or like depressions in the leaf. Uh, on the back of like an anthurium leaf, for example, it's looked kind of almost like scratch marks. Like if, so, if you took a needle and like scratched the back of it. A very interesting patterns where often only a couple layers of the leaf will be affected. So you could have them like all on the back of the leaf and not have any indication on the front of the leaf until the uh, infestation is like out of control. So that's a little scary. The thing that I could differentiate between that damage and spider mites is spider mites will always leave like a webbing behind and kind of like white dots of the eggs. I didn't see any evidence of that for these small brown thrips. And eventually as I kept looking, um, you could see these little white wormy things crawling around on the leaves. So that's definitely thrips larvae. And then looking around a little bit more, I did actually see adults, but again, very, very small, lighter in color than these larger thrips that I find easier to identify. That was my first time encountering these other types of thrips at a friend's place. Um, she was having trouble with her plants for a while and we just could not figure out what it was. <laughs> and yeah, it turns out that it was thrips, but because they didn't leave those telltale signs that I had seen before, um, I had a hard time figuring out what it was. So whenever you see, maybe you're getting brown spots on your leaves or new leaves are coming out deformed, it doesn't necessarily mean that you automatically have thrips, um, but that's a good time to check for pests, especially uh, the backside of the leaves because that's often where they like to hide. Now, sometimes people can mistake springtails for thrips. So springtails are little creatures that usually live in the soil. Um, they have also slender bodies, but I'd say it's more of like an oval shape versus like a diamond shape. And they're more silvery compared to thrips. Again, normally they always just live in the soil. They eat like mold and decomposing organic matter. Um, but if you have say like a prop box or just a very high humidity environment, sometimes you'll find them on the leaves as well. Um, but the springtails do not eat the leaves. <laughs> they don't normally live on the leaves. They're probably eating some mold or something that's growing on the leaf. So if you don't see any damage and you see something like a small little silvery bug moving quickly, don't worry about it. That's probably just a springtail. The thrips, by the time you see an adult thrips that size, you'll usually see evidence of damage to go with it. So the big question, how do we deal with thrips if we have them? Honestly, if it's a low value plant and the infestation is really bad, the best thing you can do is just to throw it out. For me, like I have a lot of plants that I've paid a lot of money for and it's not always worth it for me to risk damaging my whole collection or losing plants that are very important and special to me for one that I can replace very easily. So if that's an option for you, do it. But I understand that that's not always an option. Unfortunately, thrips do take a bit of commitment and effort to treat. So as long as you can stick with it, you should still be able to get rid of them. Um, just be aware that you really have to stay on top of things. If you find one plant that has thrips, you want to go around and check any neighboring plants. They do spread um, very quickly and they're so small. They're so easy to miss. So just make sure you check everything if you found one that's infested um, If you know for sure that it's a plant that you just brought home You're a little bit safer But if it's one that's been in your collection in that spot for a while and you're just noticing thrips on it now They could have spread very far. So make sure you check everybody and again check all the backs of the leaves not just on the surface Often you'll see very subtle signs and by the time you see really obvious signs of thrips damage, the infestation will have already spread and become much more difficult to manage. So I see a lot of people with thrips just recommend or use systemic granules and call it a day. So the way systemic works is you sprinkle the granules on your soil, 
the pesticide essentially gets taken up by the plants. And then when you have an insect that feeds on the leaves, it will ingest the poison and it will die. Basically, you can't really get those in Canada. <laughs> Some people might be able to get them if, you know, they know someone who can get it from the States, but since it's not like technically legal, I'm obviously not going to recommend that. I know in Canada from some of the like agricultural websites I was looking at, um, a lot of the push seems to be on using biological control. So using beneficial insects to control the pests. You do have to do your research when you're choosing a beneficial insect. Some are better for prevention. Some only work if you have like an active infection already. So you just kind of have to keep that in mind. I personally have not used beneficials for thrips. I know other people have with success. Um, other people have had, you know, mixed results with them and uh, you shouldn't go spending a ton of money on them if uh, you're, you haven't done the research to even make sure it's the right thing. So why they seem to be pushing biological controls is that thrips actually seem to become immune to pesticides and stuff uh, very quickly. So the downside of using chemicals is that your thrips population could become resistant to it. Um, and then those chemicals that were working beautifully uh, stop working. So that's one thing to be aware of. Okay, so regardless of what you're doing, the best initial kind of treatment is just to cut off any leaves that are damaged. Um, thrips lay their eggs in the plant tissue. So if, if you've had a thrips crawling around on your leaf and it's been chewing, it's also been laying eggs. And those eggs are in the leaves. So the quickest way to get rid of them is to chop off the leaves. You might be hesitant to do this if it's a plant that you really, really love. Rest assured that plants can recover and become beautiful, even being chopped down to pretty much a stump. So even though it might not be pretty at the time, it will be the best thing for your plant in the long run. If you don't want to do this, it's not like you can't get rid of thrips without chopping off the leaves, but it will make the process much, much, much faster because you're like eliminating a whole um, generation essentially that would have hatched from that leaf. So I really recommend just chopping the leaves if you can. <laughs> That's in my experience the best and quickest way to get rid of them and the more aggressive you can be honestly the better. I know with my alocasias I know they grow back quickly so I'm not afraid to just chop them right to the base as soon as I see uh, thrips or even spider mites sometimes because I know that they can handle it and they grow back very quickly. I would be a bit more hesitant if I had something like an anthurium, for example, that maybe only grows a leaf for me every couple months. In that case, I might just cut off the specific areas that I can see are damaged. So after cutting off any leaves that are obviously like damaged, uh, the next thing that I do is I'll spray with um, insecticide and I'll usually add some neem oil to that. Um, the ratio that I have seen for like a neem oil mixture is usually like one milliliter of neem oil to 100 milliliters of liquid. So I think that's what I've been doing, but I don't always measure. I, I find um, it doesn't matter that much. <laughs> I don't use neem oil just by itself when I'm doing treatment because neem oil isn't really designed to kill the pests right away. Um, how it works is it has a compound in it that actually mimics one of the reproductive hormones or, or a hormone in the reproductive cycle of insects. So it prevents them from breeding or at least slows down their breeding or can slow down their breeding. Um, I personally found it to be effective in preventing um, populations from coming back or just reducing the number of bugs that come back. But it's not like a all-in-one, you treat it with neem, all the bugs are going to be dead. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. There is like a chemical that you can buy, I know in the States, that, that is essentially just the active ingredient in neem oil, um, but of course much more concentrated. Don't think you can get that in Canada. Canada is very restrictive in terms of uh, what you can use and what kind of chemicals you can buy. 
So I mix my neem with endol. Endol is very easy to get in Canada. You can get it pretty much anywhere. I know people have mixed ideas or results with it personally. I haven't had it damage my plants, but I know other people have had that concern. So if you are worried about that, you know, test a couple leaves before you go spraying your whole collection. So as far as active ingredients in Endol, it says potassium salts of fatty acids, 1% and pyrethrins, 0.01%. Uh, so the potassium salts of fatty acids, that's essentially like your insecticidal soap that's going to, from my understanding, essentially coat the insects and kill them by preventing them from breathing. It's not like a pesticide in, in that it's a poison, it's more of like a physical way of killing them, if that makes sense. The pyrethrins are going to be the actual poison component, I guess. And in my experience is effective at doing its job. Now, I also used this stuff, uh, which says permethrin, 0.25%. So I'm assuming that permethrin is some sort of like derivative or similar to pyrethrins. I believe that's also the active ingredient in like Dr. Doom that I've seen a lot of people recommend. Now, for me, maybe it's just the concentration. This leaves a very like sticky, shiny residue. And at first I thought, oh, that's great because it'll stay on the plant leaves longer. But I found um, spraying leaves with this and also plants I've gotten in that I know people have sprayed with Dr. Doom before I've gotten them. Uh, eventually it was very damaging on the leaves. It, it seemed like it almost choked the leaves. So I don't recommend <laughs> using this. It's not great if you have, you know, a few healthy leaves left and then they end up dying just because of something that you've sprayed on them. So yeah, using a stronger chemical isn't always actually in your best interest. It's not necessarily going to get rid of the bugs faster. I'm sure in every country there's going to be something different that's available to you. So try and just do, do your research. If you don't want to use like a harsh chemical at all, um, you can use, how do you, how do you pronounce Castile soap? Castile? Castile. Castile soap. Okay, let's try that. You can use like a Castile soap or an insecticidal soap and just wipe the leaves with that, spray your plants with that. Um, that should do the same job of just killing any live bugs. And the biggest thing, no matter what kind of treatment you're doing, is just to be consistent with it. In my experience, no matter what you treat your plants with, how many leaves you cut off, whether you replace the soil or not, you can be completely bug free and then about a week later you might see one or two adults. That's been my experience with thrips. You never get all of them on the first go. So the biggest thing is just be consistent. Check your plants every day or every couple days. Treat them once a week and you want to keep doing that until basically you don't see bugs at all for a month. So when I get a plant with bugs and I've gotten all of them together that have them, I usually collectively quarantine them. You can do that with either a plastic bag or a tote just to separate them from your other plants and keep the thrips from spreading. I keep them quarantined until I haven't seen a thrips in at least a month. So like three to four weeks. That is usually pretty safe, but even then I still like to keep an eye on them. They can go dormant, so even when you think you've gotten all of them, there could be something in the soil, like you just don't know. They're also super small and good at hiding, so it's possible that they could be on another plant that you didn't see, or hiding in a leaf that's still unfurling and you can't possibly see. They can, they can squeeze in very small crevices and there's no way of seeing them. So just keep them quarantined even though you think you've gotten all of them. Just kind of wait and be very patient and consistent with it. And I promise you that you will get rid of them eventually.
Some people might recommend changing the soil. So one phase in the thrips life cycle is in the soil. So the way it goes is the adults lay the eggs on the leaves, the eggs hatch into larvae, the larvae grow, they get to a certain size, then they fall off into the soil as pupae. And in the soil, they grow until they uh, become adults and emerge up out of the soil. So what you can do is scrape off the top layer of soil or change the soil completely. For me, that's a lot of work and I find it stresses the plants when they're already in a stressful state, so I usually don't do it. Another option is to put diatomaceous earth on the top of the soil. Now, a few things about diatomaceous earth, it only works when it's dry. So it's not going to work after you've watered your plant. So you could bottom water, I guess, and keep the top layer dry. That will keep it effective. Basically how it works is the structure of it is very sharp to small creatures like thrips. It's like a bunch of little razor blades that they would be crawling through. Diatomaceous earth or DE is effective. It's pretty cheap and, and easy to get. So you can do that as well, put it on the surface of the soil, and then you're again kind of eliminating one phase of the life cycle, which is a good way to break that cycle. And then the only kind of thrips you'll be killing are the little stragglers that are left over and somehow, you know, manage to get through all these different areas where you're hitting the life cycle. So you kill the adults that you can see, you kill the larvae that you can see, you cut off the leaves so you get rid of the eggs. And if you have this defense also in the soil, you're covering the life cycle pretty well and you have a pretty good chance of getting rid of them. Personally, I find diatomaceous earth very messy, so I don't really like to use it. I find it's not necessary, but I would use it if I had a plant that was very badly infested. It's also effective against uh, fungus snaps for the same reason. So it's a good thing kind of just to keep on hand in your arsenal and isn't dangerous to humans or pets. So it's uh, a nice natural way of dealing with the problem. So last question is where did the thrips come from? They're very small. They can come in from outside. Even if you have like a screen door, they're small enough that they can come through the screen door. You can also get them if you bring a plant home from the nursery. Even if you look at it and it doesn't seem like it has bugs, there could be some in the plant tissue, it could be in the soil, and the seller might not even know about it. So shouldn't criminalize sellers too much if you get a plant in and then it gets thrips later. They might ha not have had any idea because it can take a while for thrips to actually show themselves. I've even seen people get them in on vegetables, like groceries that you bring into your house. Uh, I think there's a, a type of onion thrips that is very common. So that's another way that they could come into your house. Cut flowers are another way that a lot of pests end up coming into your house. So it could be any number of reasons and it's, it's no one's fault. <laughs> so try not to be too um, hard on yourself if you find them. Honestly, it happens to everyone. And you can beat them. Like I know it's difficult, but you can get through it. You just have to be consistent. Keep at it and you can um, beat them and your, and your plants can come through and be healthy afterwards. I've had a time when pretty much every plant in my collection I found it on one plant and then, you know, over the course of the summer, I kept finding them on more and more plants and they kept coming back after I thought I had finally beaten them. But, you know, eventually my plants were covered, the, the thrips were gone, my, my plants are now thriving. I don't think I actually, um, I don't think I lost any to thrips. I, I don't think any of them actually died because I was able to, you know, treat them and, and catch the infection early enough. So it can be done. <laughs> I know it's no fun and, and nobody likes to get them, but uh, you can do it. And I hope that you found this video helpful. Please let me know if you did. I really appreciate it. I've again been overwhelmed with the positive response to my last video and stuff. So I hope that I can keep making videos for you guys in the future. Okay, see ya. Oh,